Hi everyone, in this video we're going to be talking about the graph of a rational function. And so we're going to be graphing the functions and then at the end we'll solve an applied problem. So previously we've learned all about the properties of a rational function. So if you don't know about those, please watch that video. And then we're going to put all that together and graph these functions. So I'm doing quite a few examples here. So we're going to graph this function. So the first thing we're going to do is factor the numerator and the denominator and see if any factors divide out and also this will tell us about our domain. So we have on the bottom x plus 3, x minus 3 and so that lets us know that the domain of our function is all real numbers except those values that would make the bottom 0 because remember you don't want your denominator to be 0 because then your whole function would be undefined. And that's going to give us our vertical asymptotes when we go to write those asymptotes down. Okay, so we already have our function in lowest terms because nothing divided out. Next, we're going to find the intercepts, x and y, and then determine the multiplicity of the zeros, which is our x-intercepts, and that's going to help us graph as well. Okay, so remember for a y-intercept, you let x equal 0. So just plug in 0 into your function, and when you do that, you're going to get 1 9th. So that's going to be our y-intercept. And now our x-intercepts, remember that's when y equals 0, but that's our function. So that's when we set our whole function equal to 0. So if you go back and you say our function was x minus 1 over x squared minus 9 equal to 0, you can skip the step where you would start to solve this. Watch, I'll show you why. Um, and you could just go ahead and set the numerator equal to 0 because watch what happens. As soon as you begin solving this, you would say, okay, I'm going to multiply both sides by this denominator, and then look what happens. As soon as you do that, on the left side, it's going to divide out these two terms, and you get x minus 1. And the right side, 0 times anything is just 0. So you can skip that step and just always find the zeros of the numerator. That'll save you a little bit of time. Okay, so solving for the numerator equal to 0, we get 1. So then our only x-intercept is 1 comma 0. And this only occurred once, so we didn't have to factor it or anything to have it occur more than once. And the point of mentioning that is that the multiplicity is odd. And we've talked about this in the past as well. Odd multiplicity means that our graph crosses through that point instead of just touching the point and bouncing back. All right, so next we're going to find our vertical asymptotes. And so this is going to be the values basically when our denominator was 0 because our function would be undefined at those numbers. And what happens, and we learned about this last time, is our y values, in this case it's r of x, but our y values go to the infinities, either positive infinity or negative infinity when we get really, really close to these numbers that would make our function undefined. And so that's why those are vertical asymptotes. So we have two of them. And then something new here is to know the multiplicity of these uh, zeros for the asymptote. Because what's going to happen is that's actually going to help us with the behavior around the asymptotes. And I'll draw this out for you in, in the example so you'll see it. But if the multiplicity is odd, meaning for the denominator, if we go back, if you remember it was x minus 3, x plus 3. Each of these only occurred once, these factors. So that invisible one there. So these were odd multiplicities. And so the in behavior pretty much does uh, the opposite things. It, do, it doesn't both go up to infinity and both down to negative infinity. One side goes up to infinity and the other side goes down to negative infinity because of odd. But I'll put that together when we start to plot some points for you. So next is to find the horizontal or oblique asymptotes. And last time when we learned about this, there was three different cases. So there was case one, the degree on the top was smaller than the degree on the bottom. That means that we had a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. And then we had case two, which was when the degree on the top was the same as the degree on bottom. And this one was an asymptote, if you divide the leading coefficients, we called them a sub n and b sub n. 
and then case three, we didn't have a horizontal asymptote, but we did have oblique if m was exactly one less than m. So there was no horizontal asymptote here, but if n was exactly one more than m, so the degree on top was one more than the bottom, then you have an oblique asymptote or slant asymptote. Okay, so we talked all about that last time. So putting that together here, let's see what we have. Our degree on top was one because we had x minus one. Our degree on bottom was two, so invisible one here. So n was one, m was two. And so because one is less than two, we have case one. So y equals zero, this line, is our horizontal asymptote for this graph. All right. And so this one it actually intersects, our graph intersects the asymptote because if you recall just a moment ago we found the x-intercept at 0 comma 1 and that's on our horizontal asymptote because that's the line y equals 0. So you'll see when we graph everything that the there's going to be a point on the asymptote in the next step, we're going to use the real zeros of both the numerator and the denominator to sp basically split up our x-axis and find some more points so that we can have a more accurate graph. Okay, so if we take the numbers that we got from our previous work, we had 1 from the numerator and negative 3 and 3 from the denominator. And pretty much we're taking our x-axis and we're saying, well, what happens around these numbers? So what happens less than negative three? What happens between negative three and one? What happens between one and three? And then what happens again after three? And so we have four neighborhoods that we're gonna choose numbers in and then help us plot some points and get a more accurate graph. Okay, so here's our x-axis and you just wanna pick something less than negative three. So anything over here is fine. We're going to go ahead and pick negative 4 and plug that into our function. And then that's going to give us a point on the graph. We'll do the same thing between negative 3 and 1. You can pick anything you want. We're going to go ahead and pick 0. So plugging that in, we get 1 ninth. Between 1 and 3, not a whole lot of choices of nice numbers, but we'll go ahead and pick 2. and get a point for that. And then on the other side of three, let's go ahead and pick four. And then plug that in, we get another point. So these points are going to help us graph our function, as well as putting this together with the asymptotes. Okay, so take a look what we know so far. We know that we had two vertical asymptotes, x equals negative three and x equals three. Those were from the denominator. So the vertical asymptotes we're from when we set the denominator equal to zero and pretty much when our function was undefined. Then the horizontal asymptote was from looking at the degrees, the two degrees top and bottom of our function. And for us, the degree on top was less than the degree on bottom. And so our horizontal asymptote was the line y equals zero for this example. So we have the three asymptotes, and then we plot our points. We have our y-intercept, and we have this x-intercept. Notice this x-intercept is actually on the horizontal asymptote. So let me mention this, because this is kind of interesting to note that you, you the graph, you can cross horizontal asymptotes. So not, you don't always have a point on it, but you can. You can cross horizontal asymptotes, I'll just say sometimes, just to let you know like it doesn't always happen. Uh, but you don't cross vertical asymptotes. So your graph never crosses vertical asymptotes. Okay, so just, just a quick side note so you, you're aware that we're never gonna cross the vertical ones. Okay, so we have those points. And then these are the ones that we found kind of by randomly plugging in numbers, these other points here. And 
this is actually enough information to be able to graph our function but we've kind of uh, already mentioned the end behavior so let's go ahead and walk through that and then I'll show you how you can kind of do it more quickly okay so we know that we're gonna cross through at this point right because the multiplicity was odd but you can tell just by looking that we're gonna cross through because we have to hit the point above and the point below okay so we have to somehow connect those so we're definitely gonna cross through there and so for the rest of the graph what I like to do and it's usually a fast way to get the rest of this image is just identify where a point is and then how you're gonna get close to the asymptotes. So for example, this point was below the x-axis. It was below our asymptote. So what's gonna happen is our graph is gonna get really close to our horizontal asymptote, but not cross it again, because it already crossed it right there. Okay? And then it's also gonna have to get really close to the vertical asymptote. So it's gonna end up doing that. Same thing over here, okay, these three points we know that we're going to connect them and then somehow we have to get really close to this asymptote so our graph is going to go like this and it's going to get really close to that asymptote and then similarly down here it's going to also have to get close to this asymptote and then this last point well we're already above the horizontal asymptote so we're going to stay above it but get close to it here and then we're going to get close to this one and then that is the graph so there's a, more, a little bit more detail here on the slides about why this works out. Uh, and it has to do with the multiplicity of the zeros for our asymptotes. But pretty much exactly what I was just showing you is a fast way to do it. And so if you put all that together, this is your final answer. This is the graph of that function. It's a pretty interesting graph. It has three asymptotes. And if you kind of look at it, it has like three different chunks of the graph. Okay, let's try another one. So we're going to graph x squared minus 4 over x. So let's start by writing this in lowest terms. If we factor the numerator, notice what we get. And so no terms divide out, but we can't let the bottom of this function be 0. And so then we have to exclude 0 from our domain. So x can be any real number except 0. And now you want to find the intercepts. And for the y-intercept, if you let x equal 0, we can't. So there is no y-intercept because we can't plug in 0 for x. And then the x-intercepts are from, the, remember the shortcut, are from setting the numerator equal to 0. If you, if you don't remember that, you can always set the whole thing equal to 0, but this is the shortcut. Just set the numerator equal to 0. So negative 2 and 2 for our x-intercepts, each of which have odd multiplicity. So our graph is going to cross through both of those points. And then from our denominator, the real zeros, there's only one, it's when x is zero. That's gonna give us our vertical asymptote. So we have a vertical line going through x equals zero, and then that multiplicity is odd as well. And that means that we're going to go toward infinity on one side and negative infinity on the other side. Next, to find the asymptotes that are horizontal or oblique, we're gonna look at the degree on the top and the bottom. And so if you notice, there's an invisible one on the bottom. So the degree is one. On top it's two. So we have that the degree on top is more than the degree on bottom, meaning there's no horizontal asymptote. However, because the degree on top is exactly one more than the degree on bottom, there is an oblique asymptote. And the way that you find this is to use division. So let's do our long division. We're just gonna divide the numerator by the denominator, the divisor, and x times x gives us x squared, and then we subtract, and so that's zero, and then bring this down, that's negative four, and x doesn't go into negative four, so that would be our remainder. So the answer, just so you know, if we were to divide this, it would look like the quotient on top minus the remainder over the divisor, okay? So the quotient on top, and then the remainder goes on top of the divisor. But this always goes to zero here. It approaches zero when we go toward the infinities. And so your answer is just this one. Okay, so y equals 
x is our oblique asymptote. So that's going to be the line that our graph approaches, and it's a slanted line. Okay, and now we want to determine if we actually intersect the oblique asymptote. So you can cross an oblique asymptote as well as a horizontal asymptote, so we have to actually check. So this is what we're doing here, we're checking. So check if the graph crosses the oblique asymptote. Oblique asymptote. And so what you do is, since it's y equals x, you set your function equal to x. And you try to solve, you question it. You say, can I solve this? If so, then that's the point where I'm gonna cross. So I'm checking, I'm gonna try to solve, and when I go through this, if I multiply both sides by x, then I get on the right side x squared, and then from here, if I subtract x squared from both sides, notice this is impossible. Negative four is never gonna be zero, so that means that no, we are not going to cross the oblique asymptote. So you do wanna check if your graph crosses, so I'll say note, check if the graph crosses either the horizontal or oblique asymptotes. And the way you do it is you just set your function equal to that asymptote. So for us, this time it was set it equal to x. On other, the last example was actually set it equal to zero because that was the asymptote. All right, and next, the zeros of the numerator were negative two and two, the zeros of the denominator was zero, and so we're gonna use that to find our neighborhood on our x-axis, and we're gonna pick numbers, a number smaller than negative two, a number between negative two and zero, a number between zero and two, and then something larger than two. So we're gonna pick numbers in four neighborhoods again, and this is gonna help us get some accurate points for our graph. So less than negative two, we pick negative three, and get this point by just plugging negative three into our function. Between negative two and zero, just go ahead and pick negative one, and we'll get this point. Between zero and two, we'll pick one, and get this point. And then larger than two, we'll just pick three, and get this point. And so we'll add those to our graph. All right, so here's what we have so far. We have our vertical asymptote, from setting our denominator equal to zero and finding when that happens. We also have our slant asymptote or oblique asymptote, which is this line here, y equals x. So this is just, if you need to plot a couple points, just a reminder how this goes. If you plug in something for x, then you can find y. So if I plug in zero for x, I'm gonna get zero for y, one for x, one for y, and so on. And then that's my line, okay? So just a quick reminder on how to graph a slanted line like that. And then we have our other points that we found. We have our x-intercepts, we found those first. And then we found these points in our different neighborhoods around the x-intercepts. And then this is enough to be able to graph our function completely. So we can use the information that we've figured out already, which is mentioned here, but we can tell just by going through the points that this is how the graph is gonna look. We cross through this x-intercept here, and we have to get really close to our asymptote. And then we have to go up to this point and get really close to that asymptote. And then the same thing's gonna happen on this side. We're gonna cross through our x-intercept, and then we have to go down and get really close to this asymptote and go up and get really close there. And so just putting all that information together, uh, you can kind of do it quickly like the way I just showed you. And so this is your final answer. This is your graph of your function. Okay, let's keep going and do another example. So we're gonna graph x to the fourth plus four over x squared. And so on this one, zero is the only number we can't plug into the function. And it's because it would make the denominator zero. And then there's no intercepts on this graph. So no y-intercept because if we plug in zero, it's undefined, so we actually can't do that. And then if we set the function equal to zero, this wouldn't be a real number if you try to solve this. X to the fourth equals negative four. So no intercepts. 
and then we have just a vertical asymptote so far. So when the denominator is 0, when x gets plugged in to be 0, is our vertical asymptote. And then this time, the multiplicity is even, because if you notice the power here, or if you just think of how many times you would plug in 0 to get the bottom to be 0, um, so an even multiplicity means that the behavior around that asymptote is going to do the same thing on both sides. It's either going to both go up toward infinity or both go down toward negative infinity. And so then, if we look at the degree of the numerator and the degree of the denominator, there's no horizontal asymptote, so n is greater than m, and there's also no oblique asymptote because we don't have n being exactly one more than m. So we don't have a whole lot of things to plot yet. We only have one vertical asymptote. And so what ends up happening is we look at the power function of x squared because as we plug in very large values for x approaching infinity or negative infinity, then this function behaves like x squared because you, you can pretty much think of getting rid of this 4 because adding uh, 4 to infinity to the fourth power is negligible. And so we're going to use that to help us graph. So our graph will actually approach the graph of x squared, which is a parabola. And we're not going to intersect that um, graph, and so that we only have a few things to work with to be able to plot our points and our graph. So our points are going to come from just choosing numbers on around our vertical asymptote, the zero of the denominator. So we're going to pick something on the left and something on the right, and just plug those into the function. And so we have just two points so far to plot on our graph. And then this is what we get. So we have our two points that we just found on either side of our vertical asymptote. And then we know that the behavior on the asymptote around it, the vertical one, either both sides go up or down. And so it has to go up because these points are already above this parabola here. And so the only option is to go up and approach from the left and the right toward this asymptote. And then as we go out toward negative infinity and positive infinity for x, our graph gets closer and closer to that parabola. So that's why this way the graph goes up and out toward the left and up and out toward the right. Okay, so now let's do another one. And this function, we're gonna end up factoring this. So if we factor the numerator and the denominator, we get this for our domain. And notice you cannot plug in three or negative three or two because then it would be undefined. This would equal zero. So those are gonna end up being our vertical asymptotes. And then our y-intercept comes from plugging in zero. So if you plug in zero into your function, then you notice what you'll get. You'll get zero on top and negative 6 on bottom, which is 0. So the y-intercept is 0, 0. And then our x-intercepts are going to be from setting the numerator equal to 0. Remember that shortcut. So if you set the numerator equal to 0, you're going to get 2x equals 0 or x minus 1 equals 0 when you just use your zero product property from right here and then you get x is 0 for one of your intercepts and x is 1 for the other one. And both of these have an odd multiplicity. Both only occur once. So x is 0, x is 1 only occurs once. And so odd multiplicity means that when we plot those points, we're going to cross through them. So those are both cross points. And so now we have our vertical asymptotes and they occur when the denominator is zero. So we have multiplicity of one on both of these. And so odd multiplicity. And that means that on one side of the asymptote, the graph's gonna go to infinity. On the other side, it's gonna go down toward negative infinity. Okay, next is to find the horizontal asymptote if it exists. And it does this time because the degree in the numerator was two. The degree in the denominator was also two. 
and when those two degrees match, then your asymptote, your horizontal asymptote, is the line y equals the quotient or ratio of the leading coefficients. So you take the leading coefficient from the numerator, divide it by the leading coefficient from the denominator, and for us, this example, the leading coefficient on top was 2, on bottom was invisible 1, and so we're going to get the line y equals 2 as our horizontal asymptote. And now what we have to do is we have to check. So because we actually got a horizontal asymptote, we have to check if our graph crosses or intersects that asymptote. So we want to see if our function equals the asymptote. So real quick, just so you know what we did, we're doing here, we're setting the function equal to the asymptote and we're questioning it. We're saying, is this ever going to happen? And then that will let us know if we're going to intersect it. So we're trying to solve this equation. And so what you're going to do is just multiply both sides by the denominator. So I'm going to multiply the left by x squared plus x minus 6 and that's going to divide out on the left and then I'm going to multiply the right side by that as well and I'll have to just distribute the 2. And so that's where this came from on the right side, from distributing 2 to these terms. And now we want to combine like terms and if you subtract 2x squared from both sides, those are gone. And then let's go ahead and bring the x's to the left. So subtract 2x from both sides. And we get negative 4x equals negative 12. And we got x equals 3. So we got an answer. And so that means that our graph does actually intersect our asymptote. And it intersects when x is 3. And then we already know it's the line y is 2. So it's at this specific point that we're going to be intersecting our asymptote. Alright, and now next, let's find some more points to plug in, and these are going to be around all of our uh, asymptotes basically, around our real zeros from the denominator and the numerator, and we have quite a few neighborhoods to check, so we're splitting up our x-axis, so we're going to be picking numbers in five different neighborhoods this time. Okay, so we'll go ahead and pick negative 4 on the left, plug that into our function, and get a point to pl a plot. In between negative 3 and 0, we're going to pick negative 1, plug that into our function, and get this point to plot. In between 0 and 1, we're going to pick, uh, not, there's not a whole lot of nice choices, we'll just pick point 5, and then we'll plot that point between 1 and 2. Again, not very nice choices, but we'll pick 1.5, plug that in, and get that point. And then larger than 2, we'll pick 3 and plug that in. Alright, so based on everything that we have talked about, we can tell how the graph is going to approach our asymptotes. But let's go ahead and just start plotting the points to show you what happens. Okay, so we have our asymptotes here. We have our horizontal at y equals 2. We have two vertical asymptotes at x equals negative 3 and x equals 2. And then let's plot our points. We have our x and y intercept here. Both intercepts are the same at that point. x intercept right here. And then all of these points are the other points that we found by choosing numbers around our asymptotes. Okay, so we plot all those points. And then even without these blue arrows, you can kind of tell what's going to happen. In the middle here, let's start in the middle. We have to cross through these points. So we have to touch these points. So we're going to go through that. So we know the graph is going to do this. And then it's going to hit this point. So it's going to go here. And then it has to approach our vertical asymptote. So the only real option is to keep going down like this. Same thing on the right, right over here. We're going to hit this point, And then we have to approach our vertical asymptote. So we're going to go down like this. Now, on the right side, this one's a little interesting. Remember this point? This is the one where we intersected our asymptote that we just found. And so our graph, it's still going to approach our horizontal asymptote as x goes to infinity. So even though we're going to hit that point and cross through like this, 
the graph's gonna come down, but it's gonna come back up and get really, really close to that asymptote. And then over here, it's gonna get really close to the vertical asymptote. And then our last point over here in this little area, our, really, our only option really is to go up toward this asymptote and then down toward this one. And so just based on all of our points, we could see how we're gonna connect those. And so that is what our graph ends up looking like. All right, so we're gonna do one more like this. And this time, because this one has a hole, it's a little different. Uh, we did quite a few examples. Hopefully this gives you a lot of background and information and practice for graphing these rational functions. And so I just wanna show you this other type where there's a hole in the graph. So notice if you factor this function, two of the factors actually divide out from the numerator and the denominator, uh, the x minus three. And so first, the domain is x can't be negative three or three, even though that factor divides out. We still have to exclude the positive three because originally we could not plug in three or negative three, even though we simplified. Okay, so this is the new function, the way it looks in lowest terms keeping in mind that you cannot plug in three still, even though that factor divided out. And so our y-intercept, when we plug in zero, we get one-third. And then our x-intercept, when we set our function equal to zero, the numerator, we're going to get negative one-half when, when you solve. So that's going to be our x-intercept at negative one-half comma zero. And then that one has odd multiplicity, so we're gonna cross through that point. And then x plus three is the only factor in the denominator that's remaining after we simplified. And so that's the only one that's actually a vertical asymptote. This x equals negative three, what makes that factor zero. And so that's gonna be our vertical asymptote. But then we still have to account for the other factor that we divided out. So real quick, before we move on, the multiplicity on that was odd. This only occurred once as a factor uh, right here. And then that means that our ends of our, uh, are approaching our asymptote, they're gonna go toward infinity on one side and negative infinity on the other side. Okay, so even though three can technically get plugged into the function at the simplified version, because now our function looks like 2x plus 1 over x plus 3. It still couldn't get plugged into the original unsimplified function, and so our graph actually has a hole in it at that point. And so what you do is you just plug in the number into the function, the simplified version, and that's where 7, 6 comes from. So when we draw our graph, we're gonna draw an open circle at this point. All right, and now the horizontal asymptote, if it exists, we take a look at the degree in the numerator and the degree in the denominator. They are both degree two to start with. And even when we simplify, they simplified both to degree one. And so we have a horizontal asymptote of the leading coefficient from the numerator divided by the leading coefficient from the denominator. And for us, that was two from the numerator and one in the denominator. So our line y equals two is going to be our horizontal asymptote. And now we need to figure out if we're going to cross this asymptote. So we're gonna check by plugging in our function equal to that asymptote and trying to solve. So we question this and we try to solve. And then if we get a value, then it's gonna intersect at that point. So multiply both sides of this equation by the denominator. On the left, it's going to divide out, but on the right, you're going to distribute. And then if we simplify and combine like terms, and you subtract two x from both sides, notice this is not ever gonna happen. So that means that we tried to see if this was gonna intersect our function that intersecting that asymptote, and it's not going to. So we're not intersecting our horizontal asymptote. And then next step, before we put it all together, we split up our x-axis 
with our zeros that we found from the numerator and the denominator. So we're going to plug in numbers in four different neighborhoods and that will give us some more points to plot. So we're going to plug in negative 4 from the left of negative 3 and to our function and we'll get 7. Plug in something between negative 3 and negative 1 half. We'll just pick negative 1 and plot that point. Picking something larger than negative 1 half but less than 3, we'll pick 1 plug that into our function and plot that point and then something larger than 3 we'll pick 4 plug that in and plot that point and so putting everything together and our, in beha our behavior around our asymptotes we'll be able to graph this function okay so let's plot it all together here and then we'll connect our curve so we have our intercepts here's our y-intercept our x-intercept and we know we cross the x-intercept, so we know we cross through like this. We also found an additional point, so that also lets us know that we cross through that x-intercept. Then we have a hole at 3, 7, 6, and then we found all these additional points. This one here, this one here, and this one here. Okay, so starting at her right here in the middle, we know that we're going to have to go toward our vertical asymptote. We're already going down here, so our graph just continues to go down toward this asymptote. And then over toward the right, as we go toward infinity for x, our graph is going to get really close to that horizontal asymptote, leaving this hole open. We still look like we approach that hole, but we kind of like jump over it and then continue toward the asymptote. And then up here in this corner, the only option is to go up toward the vertical asymptote and down toward this horizontal asymptote. So putting this all together, this is the graph of that function. And the interesting thing on this one is that there's actually a hole in this function, in this graph. All right, so we did a whole lot of graphing of rational functions. And we're going to just go backwards now to really solidify this idea and so this time we're going to start with the graph and then find the function based on everything we've just done with all those examples we'll be able to figure this out and so this is a graph of a rational function and let's identify some things that we know we know that there is a horizontal asymptote at y equals 1 and vertical asymptotes at x is negative 4 and x is 2 we also see that there's an x-intercept here at negative 1 and another x-intercept right here at x is 3. And we should notice that we just kind of touch this x-intercept and don't cross through the x-axis there, but we do cross through the x-axis at this one because that's going to tell us about our multiplicity. We also have a y-intercept down here at negative 1 for y. Okay, so let's put all of this together. So from our x-intercepts, we can tell the multiplicity is even here because it's just a touch point. We touch and come back down. And it's odd here because we cross through. And so at negative 1, this would be a factor because if you plug in negative 1 here, that's going to be 0. And at 3, this would be a factor because if you plug in 3 here, the whole factor would be 0. And then we want an even multiplicity at this touch point. And so the, just pick the lowest even number. So we're going to say that this is a multiplicity of 2, that this factor is squared. And then we want an odd multiplicity at this cross through point. And so there's an invisible 1 here, the lowest odd number. And so this is a possibility for our numerator based on what we have so far. Then if you think about the denominator and how that would give us our vertical asymptotes, so the graph had these two vertical asymptotes, then that's because when we plug in those numbers, our whole function is undefined. The bottom would be 0, and then that would mean that we have a factor of x plus 4 on bottom, as well as an actor, a factor of x minus 2, and that's just from knowing that those are both our vertical asymptotes. And now based on the end behavior around the asymptotes, if I just go back really quick, let's take a look. Notice that on this asymptote at negative 4, 
our graph goes toward infinity on one side and toward negative infinity on the other side. So that means that this has an odd multiplicity for this zero from the denominator. And then at this asymptote, the graph goes down toward negative infinity on both sides of the asymptote. So that means that this asymptote would have an even multiplicity, the zero from the denominator for x equals two. And so going back to where we were, that's why we choose the lowest odd number here for one and the lowest even number of two for our multiplicities for these factors. It's because of how the graph behaved around those vertical asymptotes. Okay, so this is what we have so far. From our vertical asymptotes, we were able to tell what a possibility for the denominator was. And from our x-intercepts, we were able to tell possibility for the numerator. And this is a possibility for the graph. It's not necessarily the function for the graph, but it is one possibility. We, we're just picking the lowest terms pretty much for the, um, the multiplicities. Now we have our horizontal asymptote that we have to account for. It is one, y equals one. And so remember that if you get a number other than zero for your horizontal asymptote, it's because it's the leading coefficients from the numerator and the denominator being divided. And so if you got a one, it means that you had a leading coefficient of one here and here. It also means that the degree in the numerator and the degree in the denominator are equal. Okay, that was when n and m were the same. So then so far that actually means that what we have is pretty accurate. There's invisible ones here that would give us one when we divide them. And the degree on top, if you FOIL this whole thing out and multiply, the degree on top would be three. The degree on top would be three. Same thing if you FOIL out the whole denominator, the degree on bottom would also be three. So that makes sense that they match. And then that would give us that asymptote. That's the divisor, or the quotient of those um, two coefficients. And then just to check, this is what the graph looks like if you use a graphing utility of this function. So this works out well. It looks very much like the graph that we had. So this is a graph uh, function for that graph. So we work backwards on this one. Okay, last example. So this is an application type problem and let's walk through this. So we have a metal company that manufactures cans and it's in a cylinder shape. Okay, and then the capacity of the can, this number is going to end up being important, it's 650 cubic centimeters. The top and the bottom of the can are made of a certain kind of aluminum, and so they cost one amount, 0 0.06 of a cent per square centimeter. And then the sides are made out of another material, so they cost a different amount per square centimeter. So the sides cost one amount per cubic centimeter, uh, square centimeter because of the material and then the top and bottom cost another amount. So we don't know a whole lot of values, but let's actually look at this image before we uh, move forward on the questions. If you cut a cylinder, if you just kind of cut this cylinder right here and unroll it, notice you have a circle for the top, a circle for the bottom, and then a rectangle for the whole sides of the can. And so we have to use some geometry on this one, and it's going to help us find a function. So notice that for a circle, and if you don't know this, you can look this up, the area of a circle is pi r squared, where r is the radius. We weren't given any information about the radius, so we're going to keep that as just the letter r. All we would know is this number here for the volume, and then we know something about the cost. Okay, so there's a bottom circle and a top circle, so those are both area pi r squared. And then the rectangle in the middle, which is the side of the cylinder, the side of the can, is 2 pi r h. Let me explain that. If you unroll, if you cut this can and you unroll it, then the circle would end up unrolling across the whole length here. And so that's where the 2 pi r comes from. So again, this is something you would, could look up.
and this would be the circumference of a circle is 2 pi r. Okay? So you don't have to have these things memorized, but if you knew them, then they come in handy here. Area of a circle came in handy, and so did circumference of a circle. So the length is 2 pi r, that's this part here. And then for a rectangle, the area is length times width, or for us, we're calling it h for height. So it's 2 pi r times h. Okay, so we want to have a function for cost. So we're going to express cost as a function of r. So r is going to be our input, and cost is going to be our output. Then we're going to graph that using a graphing utility. And then we want to answer what value of r will result in the least cost. So basically, what value for the radius, what size radius for our, our can, will cost the least to make? And then what is that least cost? Okay, so we have our areas of our three parts of our can figured out. And so we put this together to form a can. We have a top, a bottom, and a side. And then the cost is going to get multiplied by the square centimeters for the material. And so we have two circles. So two top and bottom of the area of a circle times the cost of that material. That's this part here. And then plus the area of the rectangle times that cost. And that's this part here. Okay, And then just making this look a little better, simplifying it, this is at now our cost function. So this is a cost function in terms of R but we have a problem, this is not r. So the question said, write a function in terms of r, and this is h. So we have to use something else, some other information, to not have h in our function. We have to just have r. And so now you look back at your given information, and we were told something about the volume. And so we haven't used that information yet, and so that's where it's going to come in uh, handy here. We're going to use it to get rid of H We're going to, and write R instead. So here's how that's going to work. First, this is also something that you would have to probably look up unless you happen to know it. The volume of a cylinder is pi R squared H, and that's because it's the circle times the height, the area of the circle times the height. So that is the volume of a cylinder, so you would want to know that formula. And we know that that should equal 650. So we set that volume equal to 650. And then what this does is this gives us a second equation that we can solve for h. So if we solve this second equation for h, then what you can do is you can take this term here, this value for h, and substitute it into your function. And that's going to what that's going to do is that's going to get rid of h and only have r's in your function. So remember we had 0 0.06 pi r times h. This whole thing used to just say h, but we just solved for h from our second equation and now this is only in terms of r and this is good because we wanted a cost function where the input was r. So notice the only variable is now r. And so let's just simplify that a little bit, and this is our cost function in terms of r, the radius. Okay, so then if you use a graphing utility, this is the graph of the function. And then notice it does have a low point. So this graph has a high point, like it's higher up over here, it's higher up over here, but somewhere in the middle here is a low point. And so because this represents cost for different radii that we choose for the can, then it looks like if we have a smaller radius for the can, it costs a lot up here. If we have a big radius for the can, it also costs a lot. So somewhere over here in the middle is a nice point where we have a minimum cost. So if you use a graphing utility or a graphing website, you can just select the low point here and this minimum value here for y is 15.7 and for x it's 3.73. So the radius of about 3.73 centimeters 
would be the small, the best radius that would give us the least costing can, the can that costs the least to make. And so then the, the cost of the can would be the output and it would cost 15.7 cents to make that can of that size. Okay, so that was all about our rational functions and ending with an application of a rational function. So thank you so much for watching.